We're in the beautiful home of Judge Rod Steele in over Clo Old Cloverdale of uh, the city of Montgomery. Uh, we're, we're happy to be with you today, Judge, and uh, want to uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, uh, looking at this beautiful day, have you got any reflections generally about your career as a judge? Well, they were, my, my experiences were equally good and equally enjoyable as this day is. That's all I can tell you. Yeah. Uh, oh, it has its ups and downs as everything else did, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a grand experience and I'm grateful for it. Well, <clears throat> before we talk about your career on the bench and with the judiciary, I think it would be appropriate to talk a little bit about your personal life and some of the uh, um, historical facts that got you to where you are today. So I wanted to start a little bit with your personal background. Uh, where were you born, uh, when, and uh, the names of your parents? Well, I was born uh, in Selma, Alabama on May 22, 1930. And uh, my parents were Miriam and Parker Steele, who were both school teachers over in uh, uh, near Camden, in a little place called Magnolia or Magnolia Springs. And uh, so my mother was was delivered up to Selma, and my father went back and forth from Selma to Camden and near Camden until I was uh, delivered. Uh, they were both school teachers. You know, my father had to do double duty. He was also the coach for the football team and the basketball team. And uh, we lived there and until he took enough, several other assignments in different schools <clears throat> around south, south Alabama. And then we finally settled at Lounsboro, Alabama, where I went to high school. And later I went to the University of Alabama and earned an AB and an MA degree, degrees. And then I went to the University of Michigan for law school. Um, I had a variety of experiences in, in uh, I'm talking about employment <laughs> experiences. Well, before you get into <clears throat> your employment experiences, did you have brothers and sisters? I had a brother and I still have a brother uh, Kenneth Steele, who lives in Birmingham. He's a graduate of Auburn and is an, uh, graduated in engineering physics and worked for many years for NASA and is now retired. I have, I, I married Francis Blair Steele, Francis Blair, Francis Marion Blair. And uh, we have three children, Marion, Claudia, and Parker. And Parker and Claudia are now parents, or will soon be parents. <clears throat> and they live, Parker lives in Birmingham, works for Regions Bank. And Claudia lives in Harvest, Alabama, near Huntsville. And she was a school teacher until her child came. I see. Now, where did you go to high school? Where did you, where did you uh, go to your grade school and high school? Well, I started to grade school in Ayrton, Alabama, and uh, moved to Cottonwood, Alabama, and then my father was assigned as a principal um, at, at Cottonwood, and I went there. And then um, I, I later went to Lounsboro Elementary School um, when it was still a public school, and uh, finished there and then went to Hainville High School, which is right down the road. Is that now a, a, a private school? The, the, the uh, Lounge, of, Lounge, Lounge Academy. Lounge Academy. Mm -hmm. uh, but it had three grades, first and second, third and fourth, fifth and sixth when I went to school there. What's your first recollection as a youth? Uh, gosh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what is be... a favorite recollection that you had back in the days of either primary or secondary school? Well, uh, I guess the, one of my recollections was 
was uh, at Lounsboro School, and uh, my favorite girl was a, a young lady named Ann Collins who lived just up the road from us. And uh, I really had a crush on her in the fourth grade or fifth grade, but she was the most tempestuous child I ever saw in my life, and she would stand in the middle of the room and stamp her feet and make all kinds of noises. Um, but she married an engineer from Auburn and moved to Florida, so I lost track of her. But I, I remember that well, how, how tempestuous she was. Um, <clears throat> back uh, then, did you have any visions of being a lawyer or a judge? No, no, none at all. I, didn't, I probably thought that I would be a teacher, which is what my mother and father were. Did you have any conscious designs as to what you would do later in life other than perhaps teaching? No, I don't think so. I was <clears throat> more interested in, in uh, finishing school, to tell you the truth. Do uh, you have, remember a favorite teacher? Uh, a woman who became my aunt. <laughs> she, was, she taught, uh, she taught the third and fourth grade when I was there. And my uncle came to visit us, my brother, my mother's brother, and he t took a liking to her, and she later became his wife. So, and what was her name, um, if you remember? Daphne Williams, and uh, she married Lawrence Redfern. And I believe that there's somebody in your office that has. Uh, a connection there is that could, right? Could could be. Uh, <laughs> Redfern now is uh, is your middle name. That's right. And uh, is that a family name that? Uh, it was my mother's maiden name. The Redferns came from South Carolina, and my grandfather was an engineer for the Southern Railroad and moved out to Walker County, and there were four children of that marriage with, with my grandmother. And my mother and, and her twin brother were the two middle children. Well, <clears throat> let's, let's go, go uh, past briefly the University of Alabama and uh, the University of Michigan where you went to law school. Yes. Uh, you served in the military. I did. Uh, immediately after I finished at Michigan, I was drafted into the Army and sent to Korea, where I served for 15 months. <clears throat> and when I got there, um, they didn't know, quite know what to do with me, so they shot me around to a lot of different places. And uh, they finally sent me to the AG at, at Army headquarters there in Seoul. And uh, the colonel said, how do you like the Army, soldier? And I said, I don't like it too much, sir, <laughs> uh, which was the wrong answer. <laughs> and uh, he told the sergeant to send me to the line. Well, the sergeant hauled me back out, and he said, he, he chastised me some for the wrong answer. And then he said, he said, uh, by the way, can you type? And I said, yes, I can. I'm great. He said, you come with me. I think we need to introduce you to the, to the chief of the G1 section. So he took me to G1, and that's where I stayed for the, for, for the rest of my time. How long were you in, in uh, Korea? Fifteen months. <clears throat> and then was the war over the... Korean uh, conflict, is it sometime referred to, or war over at that time? The or? hostilities ceased a month after I got there. Um, we had bed check Charlie at night who came over and checked us out, uh, and I had certain duties in connection with that. But um, the hostilities were over, and then the peace was signed several months later while I was still there. Do you have a favorite recollection of your military days? Uh, the only one that stands out is, uh, is the same sergeant who saved my hide and, and put me in uh, the G1 section. Uh, used to read everything I would type up, you know, and he would he'd 
called me over one day and said, you spell this wrong, some word I had in there. And I said, Sergeant, that's, that's the way it's spelled. He said, well, it's wrong. And I said, well, I'll prove to you that it's right. And I got the dictionary down and I showed it to him. And he looked at it in a minute and he said, the dictionary is wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> that was only a small victory and it wasn't really a victory. Well, at this time, though, you had been through law school. I had. And uh, at that time, was there any requirement that you sit f for a bar examination, or were you automatically <clears throat> a lawyer and able to practice at the point of graduation from law school? Well, um, I, I was in school at Michigan when I, was, when I got the draft order. And I asked for an extension of, I think it was one month, so I could take the bar exam. Uh, Out-of-state students had to take a bar exam then. Other, those who went to Alabama I see. were automatically admitted. So I, I got a deferment for one month and took the bar and immediately went to Korea. I mean, went to basic training and then Korea. And um, after I was... Uh, sent to uh, Camp Gordon, Georgia, I got, a, uh, I got a telegram from my father. The, the sergeant brought it to me and it said, congratulations, you post bond. And I, for the life of me, couldn't figure out what that was. So I sat down and for the rest of the afternoon tried to figure out what it was and I, it finally dawned on me that the sergeant couldn't spell either and it read, you passed bar. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, was, I was duly admitted, and I'm duly shown to have been a resident of, of Camp Gordon, or, or uh, I believe it's Camp Gordon, Georgia. And so you uh, passed the Alabama bar examination, or got notification of passing the Alabama bar when? Uh, it must have been 19... 54, when okay. I was two months after I, three months. Then you were assigned <clears throat> and routed back to the United States. I was. What happened at that point? Well, I, I went through uh, uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas, and was shipped on here to, to uh, Montgomery. And um, when I left Fort Smith, the sergeant looked at me and waved, and he said, Goodbye, Steele. I'll be seeing you again in about a month. You can't make it on the outside. <clears throat> and I'm proud to say that I, I proved him wrong. Anyway, I came back here and look, tried to look for a job. I had some possibilities in North Alabama, but they did not pan out. So uh, I came back here and I went to see uh, Judge John Scott, who was... Uh, executive officer of the state bar and he said I think I can find something for you and he he uh, called up Judge Harwood and uh, who was on the Court of Appeals Court of Criminal Appeals and uh, Judge Harwood said to send him up and so I went up and he gave me the job $300 a month I thought it was a fortune at the time and um uh, so I stayed there for one year, approximately one year, and, and then started looking for a job again. <laughs> and I, I heard that there were some possibilities in downtown Montgomery, and so I started checking around, and I went to Rushton and several other firms, and they didn't need anybody at the time. But I went to Kanabi and Lockman, Mr. Walter Kanabi and Mr. Roland Lockman. And um, I, I interviewed with them, and they said, well, we really don't need anybody right now, but thank you for coming by. And so I went, went back up the hill to the, to the court, and uh, I got a call that afternoon from Mr. Kanabi. He said, come back down and talk to us some more. So I went back down, and... Um, Mr. Kanavi said, Mr. Nockman is going to have to go to Washington for Senator Sparkman for a little while. And 
oh, would you like to stay for three months? And I said, let me think about it because that's, you know, and I'm unemployed again after three months. I stayed for, for five years. And uh, I will have to say that that was a, a very rewarding experience. Mr. Kanabe was a, was a fine lawyer, and Mr. Knockman was a fine lawyer too. And they both taught me more than I ever learned in law school. Well, Mr. Kanabe was known as a wonderful individual as well as being a great oh, lawyer. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He was, he was a prince of a fellow. And you enjoyed your career with, uh, with uh, Mr. Kanabe, Mrs. Kanabe, and Nachman. That's right. That's right. It, they were outstanding people, both of them. And I enjoyed I enjoyed my sojourn with them. Uh, what was your uh, work uh, with with that firm? What did you? Everything. Uh, I, of course, I was a gopher for a good long while, and and uh, and had to cover a lot of different things. But I I handled um, uh, some criminal work, and I handled. Of a prep preparation of a lot of, of a trial work, um, Mr. Nockman was um, was a plaintiff's lawyer and did a lot of good work, and so I learned a lot of law and I, I could trekked out and ran down a lot of witnesses and a lot of a lot of um, other information that was needed for that. Do you have a recollection of the first case that you tried? Oh yes. Uh, I, I, I had a lot of help. I was sitting with Messrs. Kanabi and Nachman uh, in Judge Carter's courtroom in the old courthouse building. And uh, it used to be the post office, and, and they took it over for a while while they were building the new one. Is that where the, uh, the tax uh, assessing office is today that's right there adjacent to not the new courthouse but the one... I guess it was built in the mid 40s or 50s. It was on Dexter Avenue uh, on, the, on the south side. And it, I think it was where the People's Bank and Trust used to be. I don't know what, what yeah. that bank is called now, but it's- uh, it Building is no longer standing. No longer there, okay. that's right. And but how many circuit court judges? There were two, there was Judge, uh, Judge uh, Walter B. Jones, who was the founder of Jones Law School, and then there was uh, Judge, what was his name? Eugene Carter. Judge Gene Carter, who was a, really a great guy. He was, he would, uh, he took a lot of time with young lawyers and helped them along. And, and uh, the first, the first case I tried, which was mine to try, was a. Uh, a cow theft case <laughs> involving a retired circuit judge from Elmore County and and his neighbor who ran a small uh, farm and uh, the, the neighbor had taken up the judge's cow because they, the cows had gotten out and so he got sued and we represented the, the small farmer and went to court and and I had Mr. Kanabi on this side and Mr. Nockman on this side and they kept whispering to me, do this and do that. And I had all my questions written out. I was ready to go and I got thoroughly flustered. But I had a, one or two good ideas and one of them was that the circuit judge insisted on, on uh, being his own lawyer. He was gonna represent himself. So the time, this is while he had three lawyers at the table for him. <laughs> no, against him. <laughs> against him. Oh. So, uh, I, I I got into the examination, and he he wanted to take the stand. He was going to tell his side of it. So, he took the stand, and I, I stood up and I said, Judge Carter, since since uh, the the. Honorable Circuit Judge here wants to be his own lawyer. I would like for you to instruct him to ask, que his, ask his questions and then answer them. 
And I said, that's so I because I want a chance to object. <laughs> and Carter kind of smiled and he said, well, I think that's a reasonable request. I said, you go ahead and do that. I said, you have to, you know, you'll have to ask your own questions and answer them and give this lawyer an opportunity to object. Well, it just made him look foolish as, <laughs> as it could be. Uh, but I had a lot of fun with that, and it, I wore myself out on it. But uh, the jury went out, and when they came back in, they had to go by our, our table. And the foreman patted me on the back as he walked up to get, to get back on the, in the jury box. So I knew I had won before they even announced it. And the old fellow took it up on appeal, and it just went on forever and ever. But that was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with that case. You enjoyed your legal career. I did. I did. It was, it, it was hard. It was really hard going. But I learned a lot every time. Well, during this period of time, there, uh, 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 I guess you mentioned you were with that firm for about five years. What happened after that? Well, for about I was for about five years, but but uh, the people who came in were Mr. Canavi's clients and Mr. Lockman's clients, and I didn't have any, and I was I wasn't going anywhere much. Uh, I, was, I enjoyed it and I learned a lot, but. Um, Yule Screws uh, told me, he said, uh, I, I'm told that there's going to be a vacancy in the U.S. Attorney's Office. And you ought to apply for it. So I did apply for it, and I got, got was appointed. Uh, and Hartwell Davis was the district attorney at that time. and <laughs> The district or U.S. Attorney? The, the, the district, well... He was the U.S. attorney. They called him district attorney. And he was the United States attorney for mm -hmm. this district. What's the equivalent today of the U.S. attorney? Right, right. And he, uh, he wanted a personal commitment from me that I would be loyal to him alone. And I, I said, I can't do that. And uh, so he was, he was toying with the idea of not, not accepting me. But then the administration changed and the Kennedys came in. And when they did... I, I got a call from Washington, and and uh, one of the deputy attorney generals said, uh, "We want you to be um, the district attorney, assistant district attorney, assistant U.S. attorney." And I said, "Well, that's fine." He said, "Well, we haven't talked about anything about about salary." He said, uh, "How do you feel about ninety five hundred dollars a year? That's twice what I was making." And I said, um, I think that'd be entirely acceptable. <laughs> so I was, I was accepted and um, served a little over four years there as U.S. Attorney. This was during what administrations? What presidential administrations? Kennedy. All Kennedy. All Kennedy, mm -hmm. yeah. And then after that, you left and went where? I, I left and went to, to Atlanta. Uh, and Mr. Nogman helped me there. Uh, I, I knew that I would have to leave because the Republicans were coming back in and that it, uh, it would be incumbent on me to find another place because they replaced assistance along with the, with the U.S. Attorney. So uh, I, I had applied to be a hearing examiner with Social Security in Atlanta. I went over there and while I was there, I met uh, the uh, assistant counsel for Southern Bell Telephone, and he, he called uh, Nogman, and he said, um, I'm interested in him. We're interested in him because we have a vacancy. So Nogman called me up, and I went over there and applied for the job and got it. And I stayed one year, and then I came back uh, here. I, 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 after I'd been there one year, uh, I came home for the Bar Association meeting of Alabama Bar, and I went up to pay Judge Johnson a courtesy call, and and he offered me the job. And uh, job to do what? Uh, it, then it was called referee in bankruptcy. 
and now it's a bankruptcy judge. And um, I consulted with Francis, and we concluded that it sure would be nice to move back home close to my family and close to her family. So we did move back. And Well, before we, before we get into your judgeship and being referee, uh, obviously there was an important female person that came into your life about this time. Well, uh, I'll, without belaboring it too much, and uh, uh, when I was a, a bachelor and, er and trying to earn a living practicing law with Kanabe and Lockman, uh, I used to get invitations to go up to the lake and different places with different people. And so um, I, I got a date with a girl named Glenn Anderson, who was old Judge Anderson's youngest child and we went up to the lake and sat out on the beach and there was Miss Francis and I just <laughs> forgot all about Glenn and <laughs> started thinking about her and um, uh, I talked a little bit with her then and, and but then I was so busy trying to make a living that I didn't think about her anymore and about five or six years later uh, Ewell Screws told me, he said, Frances Blair is back in town. And I said, where is she? He, he said, call her parents. She's back in, with her parents. She had been, te been uh, working down at Brooklyn Field. And so I called and I got, just on spur of the moment, I called and invited her to go have a drink with me. And she said, okay. So she... She went, and um, I was uh, glad that I was had been impressed because I was more impressed than ever. So we we uh, uh, had a few dates, and I told Ewell, I said, "That's the girl I want to marry." And, and um, he said, "Well, for pity's sakes, don't don't propose to her the next time you see her. You're scared to death." So I waited a month and um, proposed to her. And she made me wait three more months before she said yes. And so that's how this, this all came to be. And a wonderful union and relationship yes, since. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. You were married when? Uh, About what year? August the 1st, 1964. Um, and... Um, that's before, just before we moved to Atlanta, shortly before we moved to Atlanta. And then when we came back, we moved into this house and been here ever since. Your sweetheart ever since? Uh, well, yes. <laughs> she might disagree. That's the right but, answer. <laughs> but <laughs> well, rough spots there always are in every marriage, but it's, it's good and solid. I'm delighted with it, and she is too. Well, Safe well, you, uh, you talked a moment ago about coming over and paying a courtesy visit on your friend, Judge Johnson, that I assume that you had uh, met uh, frequently when you were in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh -huh. Every time I went to court, he was the only judge there, and he was, he was, he, he was always fair and, and straight with all the lawyers. I mean, they always knew where they stood. They might not like where they stood, but they were always, they knew where they were, where the, where the land lay. No hidden agenda. No hidden agenda, and he was absolutely wedded to the law and uh, never varied from it. So you came over to meet uh, a judge and a friend. Yeah. Uh, when you came from Atlanta to uh, for a meeting, right, and uh, I, I guess at this point in time there was no idea uh, that uh, there was a position over as referee. Was not. How did the conversation go, as you remember it? Well, uh, he we talked a little while, and I was just in his office, and uh, and uh, I, I was getting ready to go, and he said. I got something here you might be interested in. And he reached down in the bottom drawer of his desk and pulled his drawer out and pulled it up. And he said, I've already offered this to two other people. And <laughs> he 
he told me who they were, and I'm not going to tell you who they were. But he, he said, uh, you might be interested in the referee in bankruptcy job. And uh, he told me how much it paid. Um, I think it was twelve or $15,000, which I thought was more, more money than I'd ever heard of. And uh, so I wanted to clear it with Francis, and we talked about it and decided that this would get us back home. Um, and you came back home? Uh, we came back home. Uh, we came back about a month or six weeks after that. What, uh, when did you start your position as referee? Let's see. I came in July uh, to, to visit the Bar Association meeting and to visit the judge. And uh, it must have been um, about around the 1st of October of that same year. Uh, and that would have been what year? 60, if you got married in 64. 69, I think. 69. Okay. Yeah. And you served in that capacity or similar capacity until when? Until uh, October the 1st, October the 20th of 1999. Okay. And retired at that point? I did. After, and that's how many years? 30 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, did the, during that, those years, did, uh, I guess during the Judge Johnson years, uh, you pretty well were obliged to follow his rules, uh, I, as at least as I perceive, he had a way of handling his own court. And well, he always referred to the bankruptcy court as my bankruptcy court, so that'll tell you a little bit about how things work. But he pretty well left us alone, except in the matter of setting fees. I, I was authorized to set fees in bankruptcy cases for trustees, as you well may know, and others. And um, and um, if if they exceeded uh, two hundred and fifty or three hundred dollars, something like that, I had to send the order down to him. And he had to approve it, and he usually approved every one of them. The only, the biggest one he ever was faced with um, was um, was to a lawyer from down in Eufaula, and um, I, I had given him a fee based on what I understood the law to be, and. Uh, I had to send it down to him, and he sent it back up to me, and he said, it's too much. You've got to cut him some more. So I, <laughs> my order read, in accordance with the requirements of the district court, the fee is set at so much, and then I, I justified it. And the lawyer in Eufaula was, was, was much inflamed about the matter and took it up on appeal to the circuit court. And it was reversed, and my original order was reinstated. And I'm not sure Johnson appreciated that much, but <laughs> I, I did what I thought the law required. And it was. <laughs> did you see your Did you see your years on the bench change? Uh, your duties and responsibilities change. Workload. Uh, uh, from time to time, what do you remember? Well, the first four or five years, there was not much of a change. But then the bankruptcy code was, a, was a, the new bankruptcy code came into effect. And that substantially changed uh, the scope of my responsibilities. And, and uh, within two or three years, substantially increased the workload, the caseload. Uh, we, we started hiring people right and left because uh, a flood of people came in. Uh, in 1973, when the gas crunch hit, when, when there was a shortage of gasoline, and they were laying people off over in the valley, we had tons of people coming in, and uh, some of them sick and, and their children sick. and. And they, they didn't have a union fund or anything like that. So they wound up in bankruptcy, and we, we had a lot of work to do then. 
and uh, the, the workforce enlarged tremendously and we had the trustee in 13 cases started expanding his office. And we had a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of people. You shared, you shared the judgeship with another individual. Um, uh, Hopper, Leon Hopper. Uh, and Hopper had been there a good while. He was a, a old Navy guy and a friend of Judge Johnson's and he'd been on the bench a good while. Uh, and he gave me all the, almost all the 13s and he took the 7s and 11s and, and it was a, it was interesting. He, 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 he handled his side and we both went to, to three different places. We went to, to Opelika, Montgomery and uh, Dothan. Uh, but I had by far the largest caseload. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of 13s filed during that time. Your courtroom and office was w on what floor of the old post office building? I believe it was the third floor in, toward the back. Down towards the back. Yeah. And was Judge Hopper down there as well? He was. He was. He, I, had a, I had an office and an, an anteroom uh, uh, at the, on the back side of the courtroom, and he had his office and anteroom on the front side. And uh, so we both had access to the to the courtroom. Same same courtroom. Yes. Okay. Um, this facility moved. Yes, it did. Later on, didn't it? It moved to the to uh, number one court square. Uh, and I can't recall the date when that occurred, but uh, we moved into what had been the Pazitz department store building. And um, people used to ask me where it was, and I said, we're in men and boys furnishings. You can come around to the first floor, and you'll find us. But it was a great, spacious area, and, and I, I had the fun of designing it. I, I, I did it with Hopper, but I did mainly designed it with a big courtroom and, and the clerk's office on one side and all of our offices on the other. So it worked out very nicely. <clears throat> much more spacious than oh, yes. the accommodations across the street, and much nicer. We we had a, we had a mahogany bench, uh, and we had church pews, for, <laughs> which were of nice oak and a rug on the floor. It was very nice. At some point, uh, Judge Hopper passed away. Yes, he did. Uh, and then you shared uh, the bankruptcy responsibilities with another judge. Uh, with uh, Judge Pope Gordon. Okay. And uh, I, both of you left about the same time. Uh, that's correct. I think, I, I can't remember which one of us left first, but it was within a couple of months of each other. And uh, <clears throat> I believe I left first, and I was replaced by... Uh, I, I was replaced by Judge Sawyer. William Sawyer. Yeah. And then when Pope left, he was succeeded by Dwight Williams, who would, had been the bankruptcy administrator over uh, the, the man who handled all of the administrative work involved with the cases. Uh Obviously, being on the bench is is different than being the lawyer on the floor and right. behind. Uh, how did you enjoy your tenure as judge for those thirty years? I enjoyed it. I, I had a good time. I, I, it, it was not the kind of job that had a lot of pressure to it. On occasion, it did, but not not really bad. Uh, and uh, I had a wonderful bunch of folks to work with. They, they were, Judge Hopper was always helpful to me and, and uh, giving me tips about how to handle things and what to do. And, and uh, I had secretaries who knew their stuff and were able to turn out the work, and so we didn't have a lot of trouble. You have always been viewed and perceived as a person that would always support people that worked for you and worked under you. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, you always had a great relationship with people in the clerk's office and and staff as being a very supportive person. Do you yeah. anything that you attribute those warm feelings to and the relationship you had? Well, well nothing other than that. That uh, I, I didn't. I didn't separate myself from them. I, I would visit with them, and I knew them by name, and talked to them, and and uh, sometimes joked with them a little bit. But uh, uh, it was an easy situation. I mean, we didn't just didn't didn't appear to have any conflicts to speak of. You're also perceived as a lawyer's judge, friendly to. The lawyers and 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 solicitous of them. Uh, uh, any any feelings that you'd like to share about those uh, that relationship you shared with the bar? Well, uh, with very few exceptions, they were always helpful, and they were always uh, always gave them an opportunity to talk and to be heard, and and uh, so I felt like I was. I, I, without becoming overly friendly, I was able to let them feel at ease in telling me what they thought. And um, part of that comes from practicing law myself. I ran into a lot of different kinds of judges, and, and sometimes you didn't talk back. So I, it was helpful to me when when they could feel free to talk and discuss things. And it was helpful to me, too. A bankruptcy court is a unique court in that you see a lot of people. Yes. Uh, this is not uh, a court in which you might see litigants uh, a few times and then maybe for a, a day or a week. Yeah. But this is a position in which you see uh, faces uh, sometimes regularly, but you see the uh, people that are in bankruptcy court uh, up close and personal several weeks at a time. Yes, that's true. What, what makes that, uh, the position of a bankruptcy judge, rather unique in that respect? Well, uh, I, I think it means that, that the bankruptcy judge has got to have a little, a little empathy, a little commiseration for the situation of a lot of different people. When they come in, uh, a great many of them are are really on the ropes, so to speak, financially, and oftentimes health-wise, and oftentimes in the family, there are all kinds of troubles, and usually related to money and finances. So, if you can <laughs> if you can give them a a hearing, a sympathetic hearing. I think it helps a lot, and uh, that probably accounts for the fact that that uh, so many lawyers and so many people who came into bankruptcy uh, didn't feel like they were being put upon by the bankruptcy court. I, th I can tell you a perception that was felt, and that was uh, at least by the bar that that a person having taking a drastic step of declaring bankruptcy at least got a chance or two to uh, to heal themselves. Oh, sure. That, sure. Uh, that they were not easily put out uh, on a first strike or a second try strike, but that they got a chance yeah. to. Well, and a lot of a lot of fussing and fuming about that, of course, and it's at last uh, presented itself in the most recent uh, additions to the bankruptcy code. But... Uh, uh, and there were some abuses, you know. There were people who came in more than once <laughs> before they had to and filed 13 and stayed in 13. Where there was one one famous uh, client who came in on a regular basis uh, about nine straight times, I think, and he would pay a while. And then, th that, fortunately, that was Judge <laughs> Judge Hopper's client, <laughs> Judge Judge Hopper's case, not mine. But, but by and large, they were they were people in desperate circumstances, and and uh, it wasn't the case when I left. Uh, when I retired, 
there was a considerable increase in people who were who were really hurting and and abused the bankruptcy system because they had so many credit cards. They had tons of credit cards and they just couldn't seem to stop. So uh, the, there was there was an abuse, but there were a lot of people still who were because of divorce or health problems and children problems wind up in bankruptcy and you, you had to feel sorry for them and you had to try to help them. Um, and if they didn't produce, you dismissed them. They had to start over somewhere, which was always worse. Any anecdotes <clears throat> that you remember from your days on the bench? Well, I, uh, only about th three that I <laughs> can talk about. <laughs> One was a uh, was a judge, uh, I, w I went over to uh, Opelika one time and Charles Reynolds Jr. was came to court and he was a regular over there. He had a lot of cases. And he, um, he was running for public office at the time and so I didn't see a whole lot of him. He always had some other lawyer but finally he came over after the race was over, I think he had lost the election, and he came over, and uh, I called his case, and he stood up and said, "Judge said my my client can't be here. Said she's sick, and said besides that she's lost her job, and said her husband has left her, and she's right in the middle of a divorce, and said all three of her children are sick, and said she's been put out of her house, and said it's just." And I interrupted him and I said, Mr. Reynolds, is that the best excuse you could come up with? He said, Judge, it's the best I could do on short notice. <laughs> so I didn't ask him any more questions. I just let it go. Um, and I, uh, I, I remember a situation in, in which uh, there was a, Mr. Charles Reynolds Sr. was in court over there and in uh, Opelika, and uh, he was faced with an opposing counsel named Memory, as I remember, and and uh, so they went back and forth and back and forth, and I just let them go for a while to see how it would go, and finally Mr. Memory just got really upset, and he said, if you want to play hardball, step up to the plate, and I always thought that was a Pretty impertinent of you, Mr. Memory. <laughs> Perhaps so, in the intemperate days. Yes. Um, you uh, retired in 99. Yes, I did. Um, after a great career as judge, uh, do you have any regrets? Not a one. Uh, uh, if I have any regrets, if, if I have a regret, it is that I really should have have uh, participated more with the Alabama State Bar and the local bar association more than I did. But I did not. I stayed away from it for a while and then a while got to be much longer and much longer. And so that's, that's really my only regret. I, I had a lot of fun, a lot of good times, and uh, went to a lot of interesting places uh, with the bar with, and with the uh, with the bankruptcy bar too. So I have no regrets that I can talk about. <laughs> um, you've obviously met some very uh, intelligent, uh, uh, good, uh, hardworking people through life. Uh, any of those folks that uh, uh, you would consider mentors that you can remember and mention some of the lessons that you might have learned in life from them? Well, of course, I've mentioned to you Mr. Kanabi, uh, who was a great mentor and a, an outstanding lawyer. And the only time he, he, he got upset with me, and I was upset with myself, was when I missed a, a filing deadline in the Supreme Court. And uh, 
I didn't miss the deadline. I filed it in the Supreme Court, but the rule at the time said that you must, in addition, timely uh, serve opposing counsel with a copy of the brief. And I got the brief in, but I f failed to to deliver the the uh, copy of the brief to opposing counsel. And about three days went by, and the time ran, and I discovered it and tried to serve it and. Uh, the opposing counsel took it, but he said, I'm going to have to move to dismiss your case. Well, that was a, a, quite a blow, and I told Mr. Kanabe, and I, I fully expected him to fire me, but he didn't. He kept kept me on, and uh, and I was, have always been grateful to him for that. And then um, Yule Screws, who has been a longtime friend of mine, and, and um, he's always been a good good mentor. He's always been able to cast light upon another kind of light upon anything that might come up. So those two I know especially are important. And then Judge Johnson was quite a mentor himself. He he insisted on on um, discipline. Um, and he, he checked on the people that were under him all the time. You had to be on your toes. and So I, I learned a little bit about punctuality and, and uh, towing the line from him. I can't think of others right off in the profession. That but I, obviously others unnamed. Oh, gosh, an unbelievable number of them, mostly of the lawyers who taught me a whole lot. <laughs> During the five years going on six years that you've been away from the judgeship. Yeah. Any lessons that you've learned during that period? Uh, I uh, had a hard time at first after I left because I, I couldn't seem to find a schedule that would fit. And I almost drove Francis <laughs> out of the house with worrying about what to do next. But, but, uh, I, I got over it, and I've had a good time. I've, I have enjoyed uh, growing roses out front and doing a little photography work, and and um, I, I got a computer shortly after I retired, and I've learned to use it to offer all kinds of things. So I've kept myself busy, and Francis and I have taken a few trips and, and had some fun that way, and we're going to take some more. What are your hobbies? Well, uh, I used to do a lot of woodworking, just small stuff um, in the garage. And um, I would make uh, all kinds of small things, frames, uh, mirror frames, and, and uh, picture frames and things like that. And uh, I, it just got to the point where I couldn't, it wasn't, wasn't suitable out there, and I haven't been interested in it anymore. And then um, photography, I've, uh, you, you, when you go to Korea in Japan, you've got to take up photography. That's the only game in town, and uh, I took it up with a vengeance, and it's, I'm still bitten with it. Every once in a while, I do something stupid and buy something I don't need. <laughs> uh, but I, I have grown roses for, for I guess, 30 years before I met Francis, really. I used to grow them in pots, which is called intensive agriculture in other places. Um, and I've done computer, gotten on the computer. I've learned how to record music on the computer and how to make photographs on the computer. And, uh, so I have a lot of fun doing that. You also enjoy reading. I do. I, I do a lot of reading. Uh, and I'm grateful for that because I, sometimes I didn't have a lot of time when I was, when I was working. What are some of the uh, books that you enjoy? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm reading one now that I do thoroughly enjoy called The Reformation, which is the story of the, the history of the rebellion against the Catholic Church and Luther and Zwingli and all of those, and um, and it's uh, 
that, that's been very enlightening and, and very helpful. <clears throat> and then uh, I read last year a book called The Scots-Irish, which is by a professor who traced the history of the immigration of the Scots-Irish from Belfast and uh, Northern Ireland to the United States, and that's a very enlightening history. Uh, my, my father's people, I guess my mother's people too, both sets of families came to South Carolina. But my mother wrote a book of genealogy on her, on my father's family. And they came to Charleston in 1768. She traced them back to their, to where they come into the country from Belfast. And um, so I, I've enjoyed reading uh, some of the history of why they came and what they what what they had to put up with and and how they settled in the back country of Carolina and prospered. There's a quote. Seek out of the best books words of wisdom. Is there anything that uh, you have gained from your reading that you would consider wise or learned that uh, that you'd want to share? Well, I'll just go back to those same two books. The first book uh, is is pretty clear indication that all of the religious battles in the United States right now were fought out beginning in 1517 when Luther tacked up <laughs> the 95 Theses. And they haven't changed a bit. The personalities have changed some, but they're all the same. So you, you shouldn't get all bent out of shape by the fact that the religious wars are going on with the same issues. Um, and the other thing which I can deduce from the Scots reading about the Scots Irish is that that uh, the Scots Irish left uh, Scotland and, uh, and Northern Ireland. They were all quote Protestant refugees who came to the United States to get away from from uh, the king and the parliament because they were trying to tell the Presbyterians how they should how they should worship and what they should think about matters religious. And we here they are over here, 150, 200 years later, waging the same war, not, not against the king, but we're fighting the same war involving the religious right and all of the people in Virginia and South Carolina who are insisting that our government needs to take the place of the king and parliament and tell people what to think and how to live. So if those are words of wisdom, those are, those are words of wisdom. Uh, you, at one point, uh, um, enjoyed music and plays. No, I did. That's a forgotten chapter in my life. Um, I was in Blackfriars at the University of Alabama, and we, I was in a lot of plays, and we had a lot of fun. And um, then later on, when I came to Montgomery, I, I joined the Montgomery Little Theater, and I had bit parts in a lot of plays and enjoyed that. And uh, at one point, I, um, I went with the, the Montgomery Theater Guild, I think it was, and they had one play after which they folded. But um, I, I broke away from that. It took too much time from, from my work. And so I, but I enjoyed it, had a good time, and we, we put on a lot of plays. Enjoyed those days. Yeah, I did. I did. Going back a little bit to your youth and at home with your parents, uh, do you remember any lessons that you were taught as a child that has been valuable to you in your life? Well, um, I, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, the only lessons I can remember were the lessons my mother taught me, which was you will obey. <laughs> I mean, parental control was all important in the household. And I, 
the lesson I, I learned from that is not to be too harsh on your children. You, you can you can get maintain control on them without being that tough on them. And the other one is that that uh, you know, they always insisted on the truth, telling the truth, and we we followed that pretty pretty closely. What? Judge, we just uh, talked about some of the lessons that you uh, learned as a child. How would you like to be remembered by your wife and children? Well, I hope my children will remember me as being fair and um, impartial and and um, not too difficult to get along with and, and um, that I taught them a few little lessons all along. As for my wife, I hope she will remember that that I have striven to stand by her through thick or thin, and through everything that, that we've had to live through, and, and, and that I can intend to continue to do so. Uh, and to a lesser extent, how would you like to be remembered as a judge? Um, that I was conscientious in, in, in following the law uh, the very best I could, uh, that I was fair and impartial to, to all, of the client, uh, the, all of the lawyers and their clients that came before me, and that I was fair and friendly to everybody that I, that, uh, that I knew or met or had anything to do with. And um, that's, I hope I fulfill that. I certainly tried. If you could write your own epitaph, uh, what would you want said about Rod Steele as a person? Uh, pretty much the same thing, that, that I will be remembered as being a conscientious judge and a, a good father and a loving husband. And that, that should... Fulfill it for me anyway. Well, today has been a gorgeous day, fall day on the outside where uh, I am personally honored to be in your home to uh, participate in, in this presentation that will be preserved and has been endowed by the 11th Circuit. We, uh, I think everyone that will listen uh, are appreciative of the legacy that you have left as a, first of all, a person, and second of all, as a jurist that uh, all of us have enjoyed. And it's uh, great to see you again and to be in your home uh, uh, today. Well, thank you. This, it, it, it is an honor to me to have the 11th Circuit uh, to memorialize my life and my work. And I, I appreciate that.